I love the story of Gilgamesh. It's an it's an interesting poetic tribute to the Sumerian culture, and it gives us a, a glimpse into, like all good epics do, the common plight of man. So let's kind of, I'm going to summarize the story for you and then point out some things that I think are pretty interesting. The story comes from the Fertile Crescent, as we've described, from Sumer, from Mesopotamian area, and it would have been known to those patriarchs that we have been studying. Three Mesopotamian documents that we will talk about um, come from this time. One is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we're talking about in this video, and then the Enuma Elish, which is the Babylonian Genesis story, the creation story, and then next week we'll take a look at the Law Code of Hammurabi. But uh, early documents that teach us a lot about the culture of the Mesopotamian world. The story of Gilgamesh, there is, he is actually listed in the Sumerian king list and was an actual ruler of Uruk in 2700 BC. Um, there are 40,000 clay tab tablets uh, that tell his story in cuneiform in that date to around 2000 BC. And then as the story is passed on, it is adapted by surrounding cultures. And he is the world's first epic hero. Here he is uh, wrestling with, uh, I think, the Bull of Heaven in this case. Uh, but there is Gilgamesh uh, doing epic warfare. Gilgamesh is introduced to us as a god-man, uh, two-thirds god, one-third man, if I have the fractions right, and he is the king of Uruk, and as king, he is in the first picture that we really get of Gilgamesh, he is exercising the king's bride right. So anytime anybody got married, the king had the right to sleep with the bride before the husband did, and Gilgamesh was exercising that right. And so we already get a picture of Gilgamesh as, as a strong, powerful, yet boorish king. And uh, the contrast to him is his friend Enkaidu. Enkaidu is half man, half animal. And so he is always running around letting animals out of their traps, frustrating hunters. So hunters eventually go to Gilgamesh and say, we've got to do something about Enkaidu because he is ruining our income. Um, he is letting animals out of our traps. And so Gilgamesh comes up with a plan to do Enkaidu in by sending out Shamhat, a prostitute. And once he sees a woman and sleeps with a woman, his animal part of his nature will disappear and it will make him fully man. I got to tell you, the way to become a man is not sex. I'm just saying that was the predominant part of the Gilgamesh story and how Enkaidu lost his ability to relate to the animals and to become good friends with Gilgamesh. When they finally meet, they they begin to do battle with each other until they are both exhausted and uh, they become, because of the, the quality of their warfare against each other, <laughs> the battle that they, they have, they become close friends and decide that they're going to go off and do epic adventures together. Uh, so first they travel to visit Humbaba or Humawa and uh, the, the guardian of the cedar forest. And then eventually they'll do battle with the bull of heaven. And all of this is for fame. It's for glory. It's because this is what God men and men animals do. Uh, to obtain glory for themselves. All of this raises Gilgamesh on the, uh, on the radar of Ishtar, and Ishtar decides she falls in love with Gilgamesh and proposes marriage. 
And so she says, come to me, Gilgamesh, and be my lover. Bestow on me the gift of your fruit. You can be my husband. I can be your wife. I shall have a chariot of lapis lazuli and gold harnessed for you. Kings, nobles, and princes shall bow down beneath you. And uh, it sounds like a wonderful who could resist opportunity, but uh, Gilgamesh knows his mythology and says, Ishtar, you are a door that can't keep out winds and gusts and a palace that rejects its own warriors, a water skin which soaks its carrier. carriers. Which of your lovers lasted forever? Which of your paramours went to heaven? Do you see that's pretty much of a slam on uh, the goddess of love? And so the love turns to hate, and in her anger against Gilgamesh, the gods decide one of them has to die, and Enkaidu ends up receiving the death blow. As a result, Gilgamesh is so grief-stricken that you have page after page of lament about the loss that he has incurred because of his friend Enkaidu, and what will happen, and, and what comes after, and is this all a waste? And so he goes to pursue a man named Utnapishtim, and this is where I think the story gets interesting. Utnapishtim is described as the man who survived a great flood, and he's part of the pursuit of eternal life that Gilgamesh is looking for, and it's interesting because the man does not remember the way to eternal life, but he does remember an eternal plant, and he tells Gil Gilgamesh where it is, and Gilgamesh swims to the bottom of the lake to get to this plant, and he brings it up, and he lays it on the shore, exhausted from this great trial, and a serpent comes and eats the plant. Now, I think I've already shared with you uh, the fact that I think that some of these cultures are remembering bits and pieces, shards of a story that was far more ancient. And so I wonder when we look at Genesis 1 to 11 and we look at the story of Utnapishtim, the man who survived a great flood, the story of an eternal plant and a serpent thief, if these are pieces of the original story that we would have gotten in Genesis 1 to 11. Anyway, it is a wonderful story of lament and pain and wondering what the meaning, the purpose and the meaning is for the existence of men. And at the end of the story, in at least the translation that I read, um, the author has the city while Gilgamesh is gone, the city over which Gilgamesh rules has prospered in his absence and no longer seemed to need the God-man that he had been. So they've kind of moved on without him. And you can, you can feel, the, feel the sadness in the book as there's something in the past that they know they used to know, but they don't know it anymore. And now Gilgamesh in this pursuit of heroism and meaning and purpose, his own city seems to move on past needing him to anchor their town. Check out Gilgamesh for yourself and let me know what you think.